What if it rained food? What if Earth was a cube? What if we had nine lives? What if bits could fly? It's absurd. If money grew on trees, if we didn't have these, if we walked through life slightly magnetical, it's absurd. Absurd hypothetical. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Absurd Hypotheticals, the show where we overthink dumb questions so you don't have to. I'm your host, Marcus Lehner, and I'm joined here today by Chris Yee and Ben Storms. Say hi, guys. Hey, I'm Chris. Hey, I'm Ben. Hey, guys, today we are one-upping a classic hypothetical question that, you know, gets asked quite often, which is, what if pigs could fly? Which is in our theme song. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the theme song, even. And we're taking that. And we're expanding it because that's what we do into what if all animals could fly. Every single animal can fly. So this does include humans. I don't think any of us talked about humans because we really want to focus on the the animal bits. So humans can fly, but we're just not going to talk about them. Yeah, that's the uninteresting part. I mean, we've probably talked about people flying in the past, I'm sure. I'd I'd imagine so, yeah. I think we had a whole episode on it, actually. (laughs) Did we actually? I, I couldn't remember. It seems like something we've done, but only because it's just so on brand that it feels like we've done it before. Like how Ben thought we did a shark question before we did a shark question. Right. I feel like I remember making the thumbnail for it. I'm pretty sure we did it. I can picture the thumbnail in my head. So theoretically, it exists somewhere in our back catalog. <laughs> it's an early episode. <laughs> so actually, Chris, you don't really have time to go look for that episode because you're going to be the first one answering this question. I am. So It's episode 21, by the way. <laughs> Found Ooh, it. Ben did it for me. Yes. So, yeah, when I was thinking of this question, the first thought that popped in my head was that, like, birds fly into windows a lot. So, like, if all animals could fly, this would probably be a problem with other animals as well, not just birds. So I want to look a little more into that. And I didn't want to, like, I didn't look at every single animal. I just wanted to focus on one. So I looked at the most populous animals, and cows are the most populous animal other than humans at 1.46 billion cows and then after that are pigs and sheep at 1 billion each Uh, but i just went with cows so what what if what happens if a cow flies into a window i imagine it's going to be a lot worse than a bird (laughs) (laughs) a bigger splash zone yeah but before i get into that i want to like look at birds like birds flying into windows in general like the statistics behind it so smithsonian researchers studied this in 2014 they estimated that a range they range they gave a like a pretty big range but um they said 365 million to 1 billion birds per year die from um flying into a window in the u.s that's a lot that's a lot yeah it's a lot it's a huge range i don't know why it's such a big range <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's not, not even so much the range it's like the 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 amount the number yeah so they gave a median value of 599 million birds and they analyzed like what type of building they, the birds run into. So um, they broke it up into three categories. One, the first one is one to three story buildings. So that had uh, 253 million birds dying from running into them or flying into them. Um, the second one was three to 11 story buildings, which had 339 million. And then 11 stories and higher had 508,000. So it's it's the shorter buildings. You wouldn't think that actually that the shorter buildings have more of an effect. But if you think about it a little more, it kind of makes sense. And there's a, a study that looked more into this, like the reasons why birds fly into buildings. The two main factors were like the, the area of reflective surface, which makes sense. And then what's getting reflected in the surface is mainly vegetation is what's attracting the birds so the the buildings that are lower are reflecting more vegetation for the birds to get, like want to go to um and there's just like if you're looking at the numbers there's more buildings down lower than there are up higher so that's why the numbers are like that now if we're looking at cows uh and like what cows would be attracted to cows eat grass so they would be attracted to grass and I imagine they're a little heavy for trees, so they wouldn't really go for trees, really. But um, that means that they would, like, stay down low. Even if they could fly, they would probably stay down low. And um, their weight actually reduces the the amount that they can climb, like, the their climb rate. This is actually reflected in swans. Swans are a little heavier, so they their climb rate is 
is slower and they usually fly lower because of that. So in general, cows would probably stay low and they'll probably hit lower buildings. <laughs> I like how I was like, yep, makes sense. The cows would want to stay by the grass. Then you made it sound like a threat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when a bird flies into a window, it just bounces off. And sometimes it might like do a little damage to the window, but it's not that bad. It's more damage to the bird. I imagine it will be different for a cow. So I wanted to look into that and see like how the weight compares. So cows are obviously heavy. I wanted to look at the heaviest bird to compare. The heaviest bird is the great bustard. Males typically weigh around 40 pounds. And then the heaviest record recorded one is uh, 46 pounds. And they have like a flying speed that ranges from 30 to 60 miles per hour. Now, the weight of a cow varies a lot depending on what breed you're looking at, but it, it ranges from 600 pounds to 1,000 pounds. So it's way, way heavier than the Great Bustard. So, yeah, if, if they're this heavy, it doesn't, I guess they wouldn't really need to be going that fast to, to smash through a window. But I want to see, like, they would still need to be going a little bit fast. So how fast would the cow actually be going? Because I kind of assumed that they would be going slower. That's, that's the way I, I intuitively think about it, because they're big, they go slow. But that's not necessarily the case. So the Ecology Center studied how weight affects flight speed. And they found that, or they looked at like the flight speeds of a bunch of different species of birds. And they said that wing structure factors into it a lot, but weight is actually a pretty big factor in the speed of birds. And the data that they collected suggested that heavier birds fly faster. So bigger isn't necessarily slower. And it's actually kind of the opposite if you think about it. So like if you look at aircrafts, so they need to generate enough lift in order to counteract the like their heavy weight, which means they need to go faster because they need to create more lift on the wings. In order to do that, they need to go fast. So the same thing applies to cows. In order for a cow to fly a cow needs to go fast <laughs> <laughs> so how do i look into this a little more there were some students at mit that looked at the relationship between like the weight of something and how fast it needs to go in order to be able to fly they looked at a bunch of birds and they looked at aircrafts and they came up with a formula and they found that it, it was proportional to like the weight obviously because that's what we're looking at and then the surface area of the wing was important so i looked at the bird with the largest wings because i don't really know what kind of wings or cow would have but i imagine it would be pretty big so i just whatever the biggest bird wings are i'm going to put on our cow and the biggest bird or i guess the bird with the largest wingspan is how i should word it is the wandering albatross which has a wingspan of 12 foot 2 inches Chebus. Wow. Yeah, super big. Even for a cow, that's pretty big. <laughs> so the, the wandering albatross is actually a lot lighter than a cow, obviously. It weighs about 20 pounds, and it needs to go 43 miles per hour to fly. That's also that's also just crazy that a bird that has a 12-foot wingspan, so is twice as big as me, weighs 40 freaking pounds. <laughs> 20 pounds. <laughs> 20 pounds. Jeez. It's twice as much. Or twice yeah. as little. Half as much. Half. <laughs> <laughs> and a cow weighs 600 pounds so it needs if it has these same wings and it needs to lift 600 pounds to 20 pounds that means that it needs to travel instead of 43 miles per hour it needs to travel 238 miles per hour in order <laughs> to fly <laughs> in order for it to be possible for the physics to fly it needs to be going that fast so that's how fast our cows are going to be going which is faster than an arrow shot from a bow <laughs> and it's also almost double the speed of a tornado <laughs> so you have that image of a cow famously i guess i think it's the movie twister where the cow gets swept up by the tornado in our case the cow could outrun the potato the <laughs> I just said the <laughs> cow could outrun the potato <laughs> this is this episode is what happens when we record in the morning before we've all had our coffee <laughs> yeah um the cow would be able to outfly the tornado so Okay, how much how much momentum does a cow have if it's going this fast? It would have a momentum of 28,832 kilograms per meter second, kilograms meters per second, which is about the same as an average car going 40 miles per hour. 
So yes, this cow definitely would smash through a window. But not only that, so cows tend to live in herds and they tend to move in herds. There was a study in the UK that actually measured the heart rate of cows in, like, in different like, conditions. So like some cows were alone, some cows were with cows that they were unfamiliar with, and then some cows were with cows that they were familiar with. And they found that cows that were in herds that they knew, they had less stress and their heart rate was lower. That's so like one of the reasons why cows stay in herds. Another reason is something called the dilution effect. So like if a cow stays in the herd, then it's less likely it'll be attacked by a predator. Yeah, the you don't have to be faster than the bear defense. Right. Like the overall size of the herd makes the herd more visible to predators. But then for each individual one, it's less likely that they're going to get killed. Also, how do you get funding for a study that's like, hey, I'm going to take a bunch of cows and I'm going to make like this, these couple cows like real lonely and I'm going to let these cows <laughs> hang out with their friends and then I'm going to see which one's more stressed. Why? Just because. Because <laughs> I hate cows. <laughs> yeah, they put VR headsets on cows too, so. Those ones love cows. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at, if you, if you go slightly below the surface, it's all about like, hey, what's the least humane we can treat cows and still have them survive is probably the end goal for the scientific study. But pretty much, yeah. <laughs> still, I want to be in the, I want to be in the room when this gets pitched. <laughs> so yeah, they, because of those reasons, there are other reasons too why cows um, stay in herds, but those are two main reasons. And that just means that when a cow hits a window, it's not just going to be one cow, it's going to be a herd of cows. And it's not just going to smash through the window. It's probably going to devastate the entire building at twice the speed of a tornado. <laughs> so, yay. <laughs> just like just like the equivalent of 17 cars hitting the side of your house at the same time. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So that's fun. Marcus, what did you do? So what I like to do when um, we, we look at these kinds of questions is kind of try to pick out some like winners and losers for animals like Animals, I think, are going to happen to do particularly well if they gain this one extra ability. And the one that stuck out to me right away was actually jellyfish, specifically because I like talking about the immortal jellyfish. If you haven't heard about this guy, the scientific name Turritopsis dorni, the reason they call it the immortal jellyfish is that it has a fairly unique ability to change itself, change itself back into its polyp state so that's like the larval stage of the jellyfish i guess you can call it basically if it gets injured or sick or old it can revert its cells into like baby cells and then just grow up again back into the same jellyfish so that's why they call it the immortal jellyfish and there's like uh you know some stuff about them being a pretty invasive species because they're hard to get rid of like they can get you know eaten and they do die and all that but they tend to cause problems when they gather in large groups. And I was like, well, if they're no longer limited to, you know, just the water and they have free reign of all the sky, are they going to become a huge problem? And I, I dropped it, I kind of dropped specifically the immortal jellyfish because it turns out, and even having read about these guys dozens of times, I didn't realize they're actually quite small. The average size is 4.5 millimeters or, you know, for us Americans, 0.18 inches. Oh, about the I size always, of your pinky nail. Yeah, I always imagine them bigger. Yeah, I imagine them like like the size of a baseball or something. Yeah, like like, like baseball or basketball size somewhere in that sport ball range. Um, but no, they're like super duper tiny, which I guess could suck if there's a cloud of very very tiny jellyfish. But let's go for some more threatening stuff. So let's just start, jump right up to the top of the scale to the largest jellyfish, which is the lion's mane jellyfish, which averages about one point five to six point five feet long, but also the largest known specimen was 120 feet long. So it's about human size or smaller generally, but also it can be 120 feet long, the size of like six houses. I don't like it when their range is that big. <laughs> I don't like it when <laughs> jellyfish are that big, period. But wait, you might be saying, but Marcus, I thought, and I know this because I saw it on the internet somewhere, the manowar is the biggest jellyfish. Turns out the largest manowar actually is 165 feet long. That was the largest recorded one. So it is bigger than the lion's mane jellyfish. But it's not actually a jellyfish. The the manowar is actually what they refer to as a siphonophore or siphonophore. It's a lot. It's a big science word. It's an order of hydrozoans. And basically, it's not one jellyfish. It's actually a colony of genetically identical smaller animals that function as one big animal. And it just happens to look like a jellyfish. It's like that giant tree that's not actually a tree. It's a bunch of trees. Exactly. Yeah. So like it's it's a like... 
it's a organism that is like self synergistic with its own DNA type stuff, but like it'll actually produce technically separate animals for like different bodily functions and they all work together. So there will be in this wonderful, you know, free sky, we have a whole bunch of jellyfish that can go to exceedingly long lengths. So I wanted to see how much a problem these jellyfish were. And kind of the way I decided to go about it was, hey, the disadvantage jellyfish have is that they kind of just float around. I'll also take this moment to say for, you know, anything that lived in like in the sea or anything like that, I ignored that they needed to, you know, have water to, you know, breathe through gills and like that part of the survival so that every animal could be free to roam the skies because it just would be uninteresting if they couldn't leave the water. But anyway, the question is, is there more stuff for them to eat? So I was kind of looking at the biomass of animals that are going to be in the land and the sea and kind of comparing them. So 22% of all the animals in the world are on the land and 78% are in the water. The one thing about the about the water, though, is that the ocean, of course, is very, very deep. So maybe the density will increase if just you're in a smaller, you know, width of band. Like, you know, the amount of sky you're going to be in is going to be less than the deep, you know, how deep the ocean is. But turns out 90% of the animals in the ocean are in the quote-unquote sunlit zone where, you know, the sun can reach, which makes sense because, you know, plants and plankton need all that for photosynthesis, which starts off the food chain. So 90% of the animals live in the first 600 feet of depth of the ocean. So basically, I took all the numbers of what percentage of animals are on land, which percent are in waters, how much of it's in the sunlit zone, and then averaged it out, compared it, and threw and multiplied all my numbers together, and got an answer of 1, which means if you take all the animals in the land and the sea and then distribute them across the sky, the density actually doesn't change. It's just about the same amount of animal <laughs> density. So jellyfish will be pretty much exactly the same amount of problem as they are now for fish, which is there's going to be jellyfish around. It won't be a plague of jellyfish. I still don't feel great about 120 foot long jellyfishes around, but they'll be there. So the next place I went, because when I was researching these Safina forays about these, uh, you know, colonies of genetically identical animals, another one that came up was coral. And if you know your science, you know, your third grade science fun facts, coral is technically an animal. So for most, like I said, for most animals, I ignored the, the main mechanics for like survival and flight because, you know, scaling up animals like doesn't really work for flight. The reason that, you know, birds are very specialized to be able to fly. That's why cows don't fly because they have to go 238 miles an hour. They can't run that fast. <laughs> they can't, yeah, they can't run that fast. They only got four legs. If they had more legs, maybe, but with just four, it's no go. But even though I ignored the main mechanics for, like, you know, this type of survival and stuff for the rest of the animals, for coral, I did take a slightly deeper look because coral's kind of a weird case. Because when I looked at, like, you know, is it going to be flying around, the thing with coral is that it attaches to rocks, which kind of puts a dampener on flight capabilities if you need to be attached to a rock. And rocks can't fly, only animals. Exactly, rocks can't fly, only the animals. So it was kind of a thing where I was like, Okay, corals attach to the rock, but do they need to be? And so the answer I got from some Googling was, eh, some do, some don't, I don't know. Like, they do attach it, and, you know, one of the reasons they do is, you know, to it keeps them grounded so they can stay in one place and grow, and then also, like, it, you know, protects them from being blown away by ocean currents or ripped off by, you know, sea creatures and all things of, the, of that nature. But well, I was like, oh, can they bring their rocks with them? Like, can you just, you know, if you need to be attached to a rock, can you bring your rock into the air with you? And the metric I kind of used to see, you know, because I don't have any actual physics flight mechanics because my coral doesn't have wings. I, I did not give my all my animals wings. The part I use for comparison is a 10-pound eagle can carry a 5-pound animal and still take off. Interestingly, like, when I was looking into it, the eagles can actually carry heavier things, but only, like, on a dive because they have that extra speed. So they can, they'll be able to carry off bigger prey, but once they slow down, they'll have to drop it. But... Generally, an eagle can take off with five, with something half its weight. So our coral on a rock, it can carry on a rock that's half its own weight. So it, if, it, if that's the rock it happens to land on, it can bring it with it. And the second thing I looked at is, can it eat? Because all, most of our animals are going to be hunting other animals and bugs and things, so they'll be all right. But I was like, man, filter feeding is going to be a bit of a trickier proposition. But it turns out corals don't really do filter feeding. What they actually feed off of is algae that's living within the coral so there's coral like living within the you know within the crevices and within the coral itself that uses photosynthesis to you know create energy for itself and then 
the coral feeds off of that energy. So that's the main reason why coral reefs are typically in shallow water, because they need the sunlight to do that photosynthesis, to have the algae in them do that photosynthesis. So it can fly with some small rocks, or a group of coral could lift bigger rocks, like you could have a, a shelf come up once it grows big enough compared to the rocks it's on. And then uh, it can eat, because all it needs is photosynthesis. So it's actually going to be pretty well off up in the sky. So now we have a bunch, now we have a bunch of flying coral reefs, which poses a couple of problems for all the other animals in the sky. One, there's now lots of rocks in the sky that aren't particularly fun to fly into. Second, there's lots of coral species that aren't particularly fun to fly into either. I mean, one of the things that they do is they have like, you know, stinging cells and whatnot to keep fish off their backs. So there'll be a bunch of stinging coral in the sky that you don't want to fly into either. And then uh, the last one here, which I think is probably the biggest problem, is uh, what they call palytoxins. So some species of coral will produce like this crazy big organic molecule that acts as a toxin. And basically what I was reading about it is in aquarium like blogs about, you know, people who are, who are having live coral reefs in their aquariums. And normally the palytoxins aren't a problem because they're like part of the coral, but they aren't, you know, they, they can kind of secrete them in the water sometimes, but it's not a big deal. But the, the issue with them is when they actually are in the air because they can, they are like a fume and they can like go onto aerosols and things. And it's a pretty nasty toxin. First off, there's no real treatment for it because we haven't really had to bother because it doesn't come up very often. But it can be deadly. Uh, severe cases report muscle breakdown, kidney failure, coma, and death from cardiac or respiratory failure. And so if all our corals are now in the sky, any of these, any of these coral producing this palytoxins are just going to kind of be releasing toxic fumes into the air. So not great for us. Kind of avoid the coral reefs if you can. Probably our only saving grace here is that coral reefs don't like cold temperatures, but some do. Some are okay. There's some, some wimpy coral that's all dying out from like, you know, a degree of Celsius change in the ocean, but some are hardier, so... Watch out. That's that's basically what I got is watch the heck out. <laughs> ben, uh, what, what did you do? So I wanted to, you know, as I started thinking of this question, what I, what I very quickly realized was that there's a very fun new hunting method that's going to be available to a lot of predators, and that is diving. So commonly, diving is used mostly by birds of prey in normal, not everything flying world. I actually talked about this before, back on our episode, where we talked about the speed of light slowing down, which is episode 46. And basically just, you know, to use a, a specific example, a falcon can dive at about 240 miles per hour and basically just from three to 4,000 feet up, dive down on a particular bit of prey it sees from up there, hit it at that speed and basically just stun or kill it from the impact and then fly away with it. And now if everything flies, conceivably any predator can do the same thing, which is terrifying, but also awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so there is one real limitation that's going to sort of determine how effective this will, will be which is eyesight one of the reasons that this does work so well for birds of prey is that they have incredible vision and they can pick out like a running rabbit on the ground from very very high up in the sky where they won't be seen on, on the approach i found an article called visual acuity and the evolution of signals by eleanor caves where they basically by looking at the structure of different animals eyes uh, were able to determine effectively how distinct their vision was by using a metric they called cycles per degree, which is it's the idea that if you if you were to look at like one degree of an animal's field of vision, it's how many pairs of black and white parallel lines they could discern within that one degree before it just turns into gray. So I couldn't find the full article text, which was very sad, but uh, I, I was able to find a lot of facts from like the script, you know, summary articles. For some context, humans have vision that gives them about 60 cycles per degree. So we can see 60 of those pairs of lines before it turns into gray for us. Birds of prey go up to around 140 cycles per degree. So their eyes are over twice as, as sharp at, you know, sort of figuring out that fine detail than we are. But then when you look at other animals, humans actually have very good eyesight uh, in terms of, 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 you know, just animals in general. A lot of animals they think of as having good vision, like cats, usually have vision that's actually a little bit worse than humans, um, you know, below that sort of 60. And then if you look at other birds and most fish, they generally max out around 30 and frequently are lower than that. And then bugs can see like under one. It's very funny. They just only see gray. It's great. <laughs> bugs, that's actually one of the fun things that came out of the article is that they were, you know, 
when you look at uh, you know like the patterns on butterflies, everyone always says that they do it to ward off predators or attract mates. And the warding off predators might work, but like they were talking about for attracting mates, there's no way in hell that like a butterfly can see the pattern on a butterfly's back. It's just it's not going to happen. <laughs> it just sees like a butterfly, kind of, and that's it. I see a shape. <laughs> I see a shape. Let's go have sex with it. It makes it makes dating easier. It does. Maybe that's why bugs aren't so picky. Just like I don't know, there's no such there's no such thing as attractive. It's yeah. just blobs. I, that's that, that's a bug shaped blob. Let's go for it. God, could you imagine if bugs knew what they look like? There would be no more bugs. Right. <laughs> Cle- clear the way. The best pest control method is just tiny, tiny eyeglasses. <laughs> <laughs> so for the most part animals aren't really going to be able to do this right they're not going to be able to from high enough to actually get a good dive going see prey and and going at it because all their prey is going to be flying too for the most part there are some exceptions something like you know a herd of zebras will probably fly around when they're moving but they still eat grass they're still going to land on the ground and eat grass there so you might have some very cool like cheetah dive bombing that's going to be dope as hell where it's just like a cheetah, you know, flying at 100, you know, 200 miles per hour and slamming at a zebra. It's going to be great. But for the most part, it's not going to change too many things just because animals don't have the eyesight to really take advantage of this. So the real question was, is there anything that still could? And there is. And it's actually something that Marcus did for us to talk about, which is filter feeders. Because for the most part, the way filter feeders work, like something to say like a, a baleen whale, which is probably the first thing you're, you're thinking of, you know, the big whale with the big old... Not actually teeth or actually plates, but that swim through the water and filter out plankton. They kind of just point themselves at clouds of things and hope, right? They just go through them and hope that enough gets in their mouth they can eat it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my general life strategy. Man, same. <laughs> just point at a blob of stuff that looks decent and go. Yeah. And I couldn't find exact numbers on the density of them, but birds and bats both frequently fly in very large clouds that could be seen by these animals, even with pretty poor vision. And could kind of, you know, do the same thing. You just point yourself at them, dive on in, see what happens. So, like I said, the baleen whale isn't really going to work because it doesn't actually... Its its teeth are designed to filter water down through it and sort of just collect very small things in front of it. And the birds are, are just going to bounce off. But there is the whale shark, which is a, a 40,000 pound, roughly 60 foot long shark with a 5 foot wide mouth that just swims through plankton, krill, fish eggs, but also small squid and fish to kind of just get in his mouth and eat whatever i talked about the whale shark like you did uh like three or four episodes ago. something like that yeah and our, our shark training episode some kind of scene is just this image of you know like you know the the dawn the dawn sun is is rising and a cloud of bats is flying around above a cave and then just this 60 foot shark goes slamming through them <laughs> And to complete the picture, I wanted to figure out how fast that shark would be going because I just couldn't help myself. So you can figure out the terminal velocity of of an object, which it will be going terminal velocity. I'm assuming it's going to be high enough up when it starts that it'll hit terminal velocity. With basically just all you need is the object's weight, its cross-sectional area, the, the density of the fluid it's going between, but that's air, so that one's easy, and then its drag coefficient. Conveniently, drag coefficient is the same regardless of the fluid you're going through, and there is data on drag coefficient for a lot of, you know, sea creatures because people use it to try to figure out better ways to design ships and stuff. Um, so it varies for sharks. I couldn't get an exact number for a whale shark, but I was seeing like 0.2 to 0.4, so I went 0.3 for that. Um, like I said, they weigh about 40,000 pounds. Cross-sectional area was a little tricky. They're around 60 feet long. Um, I couldn't get a good measure on their width, but the mouth is five feet wide and it goes across most of the front of the shark. It's a little bit longer and then narrows down to a tail. So I said the average width was that mouth width of five feet. And then I did some, I basically, if you just go naively with 60 feet and five feet, you wind up with a 300 foot area, but that's only if it's following like straight belly down, they're going to be going mouth first at an angle. So falcons dive at around a 50 degree angle. Uh, I used, I assumed that sharks would do the same. Why not? <laughs> Bold assumption, sure. man. I mean, they'll figure Bold it out. Bold assumption. And I just use some triangle stuff to get to a cross-sectional area of about 192 feet. And that means that the shark's terminal velocity is about 270 miles per hour, which is actually faster than a falcon. Faster than the, is faster than the, my cow. It is also faster than your cow. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the end result here is, you know, you're going to have these clouds of birds flocking around and then just these sharks come hellaciously fast soaring through them and it's gonna big old mouthful of bird and uh munching down and that's kind of you know the modern shark hunting now 
is this bird based dive bombing, which I thought was very fun. So that's what I got. It's going to be terrifying. I'm not happy about it. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is generally where we move on to the would you rather question. Before we, before we go right there, I don't know if you guys want to participate in this, but I, I just put on tagged on the end of my note here, which animal I thought lost out the most in this exchange. Like what animal was doing just fine in the regular world, but really gets screwed over by this, uh, everything can fly. And I think the animal that's got to be the most pissed about this has got to be the giraffe. I was just going to say the giraffe. It's been its entire <laughs> entire evolutionary <laughs> lifetime getting tall, and now everything can fly? Come on. Yeah, like not only, yeah, it's like exactly. First off, the whole point of how giraffes work is that they can reach the leaves that no, none of the other animals can reach, and now that's just not true anymore. All the a- other animals that want to eat leaves can just fly up and just get up in a giraffe's business. Also, as far as flying goes, giraffes have to be the wonkiest, lankiest flyers, period. Like, there is no poise, <laughs> no grace in a giraffe flying not around. aerodynamic at all. <laughs> Actually, you could, like, it could straighten out its body and be, like, an arrow. It could. I, I wonder if they actually have a advantage in, like, flight in that they're, if you see ever see giraffes fight, which I highly recommend Googling just because it's buck wild. They just, like, stand still and slam on the other giraffe with their necks. Oh, yeah. Which might actually be a good, like, mid-air fight strategy comparatively. Because if you don't have momentum otherwise, you can just, like, bludgeon things. But, yeah, no, it's just being long and skinny in all dimensions is just not great in a world with where everything can fly around. It's just not the right thing. I'm just imagining a giraffe slithering through the air, like neck first or like head first, like a <laughs> snake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, biggest winners are undoubtedly penguins and ostriches, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. They've been waiting their they're entire just, lives for the this. They may not be the biggest winners. They're definitely just the happiest. Right, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that's fair. Although it would actually be... It probably would be sh- pretty shitty for penguins because their whole deal is that they just like hop onto the uh, hop onto the iceberg to avoid that killer whale, and the killer whale's like, "Nope, I'm just following you." Right. Yeah. <laughs> like they hop out of the water to like escape, and then like, ha, huh, they made it, and it's like, nah, it's still just following. I I do think that sort of falling off from my answer, biggest losers are just current birds. No, I think biggest losers are fish because the birds can eat the fish now, super easy. But also, everything else can eat the birds super easily. Yeah, the problem is the birds now are just getting outweight class. Right. Like, they evolved to be able to mechanically fly, but now everything can fly. And now they're just fighting, like, even, like, a badger weighs, like, four times as much as a regular bird. Yeah. Like, you have your, you know, you have your 12-foot albatross who's who's acting all big and tough, but he weighs 20 pounds. Like, a bunch of dogs weigh more than that. <laughs> Like, well, not even big dogs. If you're, if you're going with the, like, they have wings and they have to go that fast in order to, to fly. Maybe some animals don't have, like, they can't go that fast. That's true. If, if you put physics back into it. You want to, a, lot, a lot of things have wings now, and that's kind of the answer. <laughs> Technically, they can fly if they can go fast enough. Yeah, the real, like, there, there's there's definitely things you could look at, like, once if you go into the actual mechanics and physics. For example, even if your cow could go 238 miles an hour... The amount of energy it would need to do that and then how much it would need to eat to keep up with that metabolism would probably also just be absolutely ridiculous. I'm also pretty sure that from my, like, looking at terminal velocity of stuff, I don't think a cow can actually reach a terminal velocity. I think its terminal velocity is going to be less than 238 miles per hour. Because I'm assuming it's a much rougher animal than a shark. Probably. But you can go faster than terminal velocity, Ben. I mean, if you're launched, yes, that is true. Yeah, if you have if you have if you if you... If you if you use your wings and stuff, you can, All right, you can fair. go okay, fair. faster. That's very, just true. Yeah, you can you can power yourself. All right, you can propel fast, propel yourself faster. And if you're, if you, it's probably not too much less than two thirty eight. I mean, I don't know. I haven't done that math yet. But I've done terminal velocity before. I think humans are one in like the mid ones. Yeah, something like twos. that. So it's probably between like it's probably a range. It's probably all about two hundred. Then that's going to be pretty similar. It's like the udders slow them down. They're very flappy. I don't know. Either way, we're going to have a lot of fast animals in the air and a lot of floating rocks in the air. Yes. <laughs> Not a yeah. good combo. It's going to get wild. But <laughs> All right, now we can move on to the would you rather. All right, Chris, are you ready for a would you rather? I am ready. Would you rather live in a world where plants can eat humans or a world where birds attack humans? Hmm. We already did the pl- we did coniferous pan- plants before. Yeah, and we just did a whole kind of episode about lots of birds of prey suddenly existing. <laughs> yeah. 
So plants are stationary. <laughs> That's an important point. Birds are very much not so. There's a lot more plants than there are birds, though. How aggressive are the birds? Is it like the birds, the movie? I think they'd probably be like, I would say maybe slightly more aggressive than like bees, where they won't like hunt you, but they will, you know, they are easy enough to piss off. And you, if you if you hang out in their zone too long, they'll like go after you. Okay. Right now I'm leaning towards the birds because I feel like it's pretty impossible to avoid plants. Grass is a huge one. Grass, yeah, grass is a problem. Because it's, 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 plants can eat humans. This isn't, we did, we did carnivorous plants. We kind of said that, hey, grass eats like bugs and stuff. And I think we did, I forget what we talked, we did talk about grass and in relation to humans, I think in the episode, I just don't remember. I think we kind of decided just that like, like the mouse would be very small and you'd probably be okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, if you like sat motionless on the grass for like a year, they could, the it grass would like could nibble eat. at your feet. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's the case still here. That's a very important question. Man, I just remember reading about those like, ugh, what were those trees called? There was this tree that like exploded and shot things at people. And I'm like, I just don't want to deal with that. I don't want that to exist in the world. But then again, birds are so random. I hate the idea that just a bird could come down at any time. Yeah, and they're fast too. They are so very you don't fast. Necessarily see them before they come actually could you just have could you just have like an anti-bird umbrella what does that look like an umbrella that you have that just like is like one of those ones that like extend it has like a curtain on it that extends down to the ground and it's just like a a thick mesh and that way even if you get attacked by birds they're not going to get into your person <laughs> they can't yeah they won't get onto your person is this basically just like a giant bird cage but like you're keeping the birds out <laughs> yeah Literally exactly that. A birdcage, <laughs> except there's no floor and it has a pole in the middle for you to hold. Hmm. I guess you could do that. That would that work. pretty much solves it, I think. I think we just, that's it. <laughs> yeah, and you only need it when you're outside. I don't, is there any fix like that for the plants? If you were, just wear, like, big boots, grass can't bite through them, right? Their mouths aren't going to be that. Right, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, big boots and, like, not leather pads, but, like, a, a thick, like, work pants that are thicker. Well, that's for grass, though. Like, if you're looking at bigger plants like trees, then I imagine the trees could still eat you. Yeah, it, you'd have to you'd have to pick how trees work, and then we're basically deciding what the answer is based on the exact mechanisms of what the trees do. So I think you have to say, like, yeah, thick. Basically, like all let's just say, ignore trees for the moment and consider it like your day to day impact is going to be like bushes, underbrush, and grass, like below the waist type thing. So do, would you rather have a, a carry around a birdcage umbrella or have to wear boots and thick pants all the time to protect your... I mean, if you're ignoring trees that's actually not that bad if if we're saying that grass can't bite through your boots i guess no matter what no matter which trees you choose being outside like relaxing is gonna be a lot harder <laughs> for different reasons you can still go to the beach with the plant that thing. is true you could never go to the beach with the bird thing <laughs> maybe that's the maybe that's the difference yeah <laughs> Think about how aggressive seagulls now, and think about when they actively uh, are now, and how how aggressive they be. They actively hunted people. Oh my god! Yeah, I think that, I think that solves yeah. it for me. Yeah, me too. There we go. It's it's approaching summertime right now, and I want to go to the goddamn beach. Yep. And I do not want to deal with these seagulls. There we have it. Consensus. Don't even have to vote. <laughs> but besides that consensus, there's another consensus, and that this show is awesome. And one way to let the world know that this show is awesome is one: tell your friends and family about us. We'd love for them to listen because that increases the numbers that I obsessively check. Second, let a, leave a review. That lets everybody in the whole world know how awesome the show is. And also is a super great way to increase the numbers that I obsessively check. So this is really just for me. But if you do enjoy the show, one of the ways you can really help out is to leave that review, whatever podcast player you listen up to, whether that's, you know, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, et cetera, et cetera, all good or, or whatever they're calling the iTunes one nowadays. Apple Podcasts, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like it changes every other week. Yeah, but those are great ways to help. And if you're looking for a direct monetary way to help, of course, we have our Patreon, www.patreon.com/absurdhypotheticals. Just one dollar a month unlocks the bonus content that we produce each month for you, the listener. So feel free to go and check that out. And again, feel free to join us next week where we answer the following question: Which action figure would win in a fight?